Hello, driver's ed people. Well, today we have a topic for you that is very important, and that is, is understanding the laws of nature and how that impacts us when we drive a vehicle. And so there are some basic forces that are just true of life here on Earth and, and for all we know of life throughout the universe. Um, and, and what does that mean for our driving? So let's go ahead and, and dive in and, and see what we can um, learn from this topic. So a couple of things that we need to be aware of is, is gravity and energy of motion. Now, you know, gravity affects a vehicle and that's all there is to it. And there's two different ways that we talk about about gravity in terms of a vehicle. And, and one way is, is simply what you would always think of with gravity. And that's, you know, there's this force of attraction between two things. Um, you know, specifically here on Earth, we're talking about the, the pull between the Earth and the objects on the Earth and how that affects you as the driver of a car. But we're also going to talk about something called center of gravity. Um, and so we'll talk about that when we get to it. Uh, as well. But to maintain control of your car, you've got to understand these basic forces, gravity and energy of motion. You know, uh, when an object is in motion, there is energy because of that. We commonly refer to that as kinetic energy. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about um, it in terms of energy of motion, but it's the same thing. That is kinetic energy. So gravity, gravity is the force of attraction between two objects. And so any two objects there uh, have a force of attraction between them. Um, so for example, the computer mouse that I'm using uh, to control the Chromebook here, uh, the computer mouse and me, there is gravity between the two of us. Um, now, you can't tell that because there we're not the only two things involved here. There's also something a lot bigger than me or the computer mouse called the earth. And if I were to drop this computer mouse, the gravity of the earth or, or the, the pull, the attraction of the earth will pull the computer mouse down to the table here. It won't stay in my hand, right? Um, and so size has, has a big deal with, with gravity, has a big impact on the force of gravity. And so since we are living on planet Earth, when we reference gravity in terms of driving, we're talking about the attraction between our car and the Earth. And that's the, the form of gravity that we're talking about. So how does that affect you? How does the gravity of the earth affect you as the driver of a car? Well, when you drive uphill, your car loses speed. Your car will lose speed unless you use extra power. I'm telling you, I see this every day in the driver's ed car. Young drivers don't have this figured out yet. And we head out of Staunton, especially if we're taking Bunker Hill Road, we start heading up the hill and our speed is slowing down and slowing down and slowing down. And so you've got to give it a little bit of extra gas. It takes energy to go up the hill. If you think about this, you know this, all right? Every time you walk up a hill or run up a hill or ride your bike up a hill, you recognize the extra power that it takes. But for some reason, when people get behind the wheel of a car, this doesn't click so fast for them. Um, and so you got to give it extra gas. Now, if you've got the cruise control set, the car does it for you. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, but if you don't have the cruise control set, you got to hit the gas or you're going to have traffic backed up behind you and people waiting to pass. All right. If you happen to find yourself driving a stick shift vehicle, you might have to downshift to a lower gear. Uh, if you're in an automatic transmission, the automatic transmission does that for you. You don't have to worry about it. Force of gravity can also increase your speed going down the hill. So if you remember to give the car extra fuel, give it a little extra power going uphill so you don't lose speed, you better watch out going downhill because if you're at the speed limit at the top of the hill and then you go over the top of that hill, you're going to be picking up speed. So watch out. You'll have to let off the gas. You might even have to hit the brake a little bit. It depends on how steep the hill is, but you're for sure going to want to let off the gas. Um, also, something that's really important going downhill 
is that you need a longer distance to stop your car. So if you could normally stop your car in 100 feet, it might take you 150 feet going downhill. So your stopping distance is greater. And that's really key. If our stopping distance is greater going downhill, that means we should increase our following distance. Okay, remember I said we were going to talk about a couple of different forms of gravity or a couple of different uses of the word gravity. Here's use number two, and that's something called center of gravity. So, you know, we talked about how gravity is this attraction between two objects. Well, you know, I'm an irregularly shaped object, probably mostly because I eat too much ice cream, but I'm an irregularly shaped object. And um, so, so because of that, where is the gravity between me and another object centered on? Well, that's kind of the idea here. So if you can find the center of an object's mass, that is its center of gravity. Um, so how does this apply to us driving? Well, different vehicles have different center of mass or center of gravity. Uh, there's a reason that sports cars are designed to sit low to the ground. From a performance standpoint, they're less likely to roll over. They can take corners faster. They can, you know, they're because they have a low center of gravity, they perform better in turns. That's all there is to it. Okay. Vehicles that are that are higher than that, something like a, a, a pickup truck, an SUV, a Jeep. Something like that that has a higher center of gravity, you cannot take uh, take corners as fast as you can in a low riding vehicle. That's something that we just have to know, okay? And so that affects us. Um, so center of gravity is an important thing to understand as well. So a couple of different uh, topics of gravity there. We also need to talk about energy of motion. And as I already mentioned, energy of motion is also kinetic energy. The faster your car moves, the more energy of motion it has. And speed actually has a really important role in determining energy of motion. The relationship between speed and energy of motion or kinetic energy is a squared relationship. So if you double the speed, you quadruple the energy of motion. So that's that's one of the main reasons why we have things like speed limits, because we just know that, that even increasing your speed a few miles per hour above the speed limit has a drastic impact on the amount of energy involved if you happen to find yourself in a crash. Uh, let's, let's give an example of that by just looking at stopping distance. Uh, so, so stopping distance is a combination of thinking distance and braking distance. So thinking distance is how long does it take you to, to see that there's something in the road that means that you have to stop and how long it takes you to decide to stop. So that's all part of, of thinking distance. It's that identification of something in the road and that decision to stop. Um, and then getting your foot on the actual brake too. But from the time your foot hits the brake, um, braking distance is how long it takes you to stop your vehicle from that point. So if we just look here, let's pick a couple of numbers that are doubled here. So let's look at, at um, 30 miles per hour and 60 miles per hour. So if we look at 30 and 60, well, at 30 miles per hour, your thinking distance is 30 feet. Your Thinking distance at 60 miles per hour is 60 feet. So it's just doubled, right? Double, double. Well, let's look at the braking distance. It's 45 miles per hour here at 30 miles per hour, or I'm sorry, it's 45 feet. And at 60 miles per hour, it's 180 feet, I think is what that says there. So it's not just doubled, it's quadrupled, 160 um, plus another 20. Yeah, so if you take 45 times 4, that does come out to be 180 feet, okay? So, so increased speed really increases your braking distance. A couple of other topics that we need to be aware of, and those are the topics of friction and traction. Uh, and what we're talking about specifically here is the interaction between your tires and the roadway. Your tires control the movement of your vehicle, and so that interaction between the tires and the roadway is super important. Friction is the force that keeps each tire from sliding on the road. 
Um, and the, the specifically the type of friction that we have between a tire and the road, we just refer to that as traction. So traction is a type of friction. There are lots of things that affect traction, and we're going to talk about some of those today. Uh, but just understanding how important your tires are, they make a difference in the way your car handles. To get the best performance from your car, you've got to know about tires and how to care for them. OK, um, and, and so, you know, the best person to learn this information from is is a mechanic. You know, just talk to the mechanic about what type of tires would be good for your vehicle. What type of tire, you know, when you're purchasing tires, what are the things that you need to to consider? Um, you know, just buying the cheapest set of tires may not be the best choice because uh, tires like cars have different performance capabilities. And if you buy a tire that that wears really well and, and goes for a lot of miles and is also kind of cheap, well, it's probably not going to perform very well. It may not actually stop the car as well as other tires. <laughs> and that's something that a lot of times people don't think about when they when they're purchasing tires. You know, um, usually your questions that you ask are, well, how much are they and and um, how many miles will they last? You know, so if they're if you're going to get 50,000 miles out of that set of tires and you're only paying one hundred dollars per tire, people are like, yeah, put them on my car, man. That's the way to go. Um, but those tires may not be the best performing tires. And so you might be better off to buy a tire that's a little more expensive, but will actually stop your vehicle faster so that you don't get in a wreck. Or maybe you can reduce your speed and the wreck won't be as bad. To get the best performance from your car, you've got to know about those tires. So like I said, you know, I'm not a tire expert, but I know that there's more to consider than just miles that you're going to get and how much the tires cost. That's not the only thing to consider when purchasing a tire. Okay, so tread and traction. Um, you know, I want you to think about something here. Um, if you ever watch any races like, like NASCAR races or IndyCar races, you'll notice something about the tires on those race cars. Um, they're, they're smooth. They don't have the grooves that our tires have on them. You ever wonder why? Like, Obviously, they're driving really fast and they're going around corners, so they need really good traction. So why do they use tires that don't have any, any grooves, any tread on them? That's what we call those, those differences between the grooves and the solid part. Um, well, the answer is because they get better traction with those tires. But you'll also notice that if it starts raining even a little bit, they red flag the race and they get everybody off the racetrack. And so the thing is, yes, a tire that's smooth grips the road really well, as long as the road is dry and free of debris. You start getting any kind of water on the road and you're not going to grip. You're going to hydroplane if you have that kind of a tire and you're going to wreck for sure. So the tread, the grooves that are on our tires, those aren't there to help you on dry days. Those are there to help you on rainy days because, hey, we can't just stay home every time it rains because our car is going to wreck. We've got to have a tire that can you know, do better than that. So that's why we have all weather tires. We have tires that are good for driving around in all types of weather conditions. Uh, so the tread on your tires, they, they help your car handle and still maintain control on wet surfaces. Uh, so the amount of tread touching the road will increase the gripping traction. That's why race cars use flat, slick tires, because um, even though they're called slicks, they actually, uh, you know, handle really well on dry roads. But on wet or icy roads or snowy roads, you need tread. You need those grooves so that there's somewhere for the water to go and you can still have, have actual rubber touching the road. Tires can have blowouts, uh, which result from a sudden loss of air pressure. We had a blowout in the driver's ed car yesterday. Um, you know, I mean, this happens sometimes. Thankfully, we were in town. We were actually uh, doing some parking and, and um, had the blowout. So we were not driving and, and didn't lose control of the vehicle or anything. But it happens. You can, you can have a tire lose pressure instantly. Um, this is something that can cause you to 
to have trouble controlling the vehicle. So you've got to be ready for that. If you do experience a blowout, don't panic. Keep a good grip on the wheel. Try to gently slow the car down and pull off to the side of the road. Tires work best within a range of pressures. So when we're talking about pressure, pressure, we're talking about air pressure, how much air is inside the tire. And if you read on the sidewall of the tire, it'll tell you what range that, that tire works best in. Um, so whatever that range is, it's going to vary from tire to tire, but, but you need to make sure that your tires are properly inflated. Because if your tires are properly inflated, then you're going to get good contact between the tread of the tire and the road surface. And so this is what that would look like. If your tires are overinflated, the edges of the tire may actually lift off the edge, or even if they don't lift off, they may just have reduced pressure on the edges out here. And that'll cause your tires to wear funny and it actually reduces traction. Same if, you are, if your tires are underinflated you're not gonna have full contact of the tread. And in this case, actually the center would bump up. So you need to maintain your tires um, and make a regular habit of checking your tire pressures. Um, you know, you can't visually just check because our eyes aren't sensitive enough to pick up differences of five, 10, even sometimes 15 pounds of pressure. But when your tire starts getting pretty low, then you can tell, like you can tell that the tire is, is sagging a little bit or bulging a little bit. Um, but just get yourself a good gauge and keep it in the tire. Get yourself a good air pressure gauge and keep it in the car, not keep it in the tire. I'm a little tired. Just keep it in the glove box, okay? And then you can check your temper or your tire gauges, uh, tire pressure regularly. Okay, so temperature increase will actually cause a pressure increase in your tire. So checking your tires before you start driving and checking your tires after you've been driving, you'll actually get a slightly different reading. So the pressure that you want in your car is based on a cold pressure. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be cold outside. It means you haven't been driving because the friction of driving will actually increase the temperature inside the tires, which consequently increases the, the pressure. Um, temperature decrease will equal a pressure decrease. So yes, during the winter months, you might have to add a little extra air to your tire to make up for that reduced temperature. Okay, this is a really important concept for you to understand. So there's a maximum amount of tr uh, traction that your tires can produce, right? I mean, there's a limit to it. And if you exceed that limit, what happens? Well, your car starts to skid, your tires break free. Um, and so uh, the most common time this happens is when you're trying to do two things that require friction or traction at once. What are the two things in a car that require traction? Um, well, one is braking. So if you hit the brakes or you accelerate, either one, if you're changing speed, that requires traction. The second thing is changing direction. If you're going around a curve, that requires traction. If you try to do both of those things at the same time, so you try to slow down and you try to go around the curve at the same time, you're splitting your traction between two separate activities and you might not have enough traction for that. So that's why it's really important to slow down before you get to a curve. That way, when you're going around the curve, all of your available traction is used to hold the car on the turn, okay? Um, so when braking and turning, you divide your traction limit between those two activities. If you find yourself in a turning braking situation, um, and you notice that you're starting to skid, you might actually have to let off the brake and then you might have enough traction to actually make that turn. I know that seems weird. I'm skidding. Shouldn't I like try to slow down? Well, if you're skidding and turning, you actually want to let off the brake and, and you've got a better chance of controlling the vehicle that way. The best thing to do is do all your slowing down before you get to the turn. So um, <clears throat> you need two things to maintain high levels of traction. 
the two things that you need are you need car that's in good condition. Okay. So that means that you've got good shocks, you've got good tires, your tires have good tread on them. Okay. So that's one thing you, you need good car condition. Two is that you need a good road surface. If you have a road that is gravel, well, that's not going to help you with traction. If you have a road that is wet from rain, that's not going to help you with traction. If you have a road that has snow on it or a road that is in disrepair with lots of potholes, none of those things help you with traction. So you need those two things to maintain high levels of traction. You need a car that's in good condition with good tires, and you need a road surface that's paved and in good condition, not wet, not rainy, not full of potholes. Um, so those are what you need for good traction. If you don't have those things, then you have less than ideal traction. What are some things that could lead to this? Um, well, you want to make sure that you have good shock absorbers because worn shock absorbers, shock absorbers that are worn out, will cause the car to bounce. And as the car bounces, it loses pressure on the road and pressure on the road generates traction. So if you have a lack of pressure on the road, you're going to more, be more likely to slide out or to skid. Also, as we mentioned, worn or bald tires do not grip the road well, especially in wet conditions. Um, a paved road is so much better than a gravel road. If you find yourself on a gravel road, don't drive like you would drive on a paved road. You need to slow down because gravel cannot produce as much traction as a paved road can. And then, of course, weather conditions. Anytime you're in rain, snow, ice, sleet, hail, whatever the case might be, slow the vehicle down. Take things a little bit slower because those, in, those weather conditions are going to reduce traction. Okay, so one more thing we're going to talk about today, and then we'll save the rest of this lecture for tomorrow. Uh, the, the last thing we're going to talk about today, and there's a few slides here, but is curves. So we mentioned briefly that whenever we were talking about split traction, as you enter a curve, you don't want to be slowing down and trying to make the curve. You want to do your slowing down ahead of time. Well, there are some other pieces of information about curves that we need to know. There are two forces that work on your car. One is energy of motion. So your car is headed down the road and then you're trying to get it to change. Well, energy of motion wants it to keep heading down the road. And as you're speed increases, so does your energy of motion. So the faster you're going into that corner, the more energy of motion you have that you're trying to turn and you might not have enough traction to do that. Um, and then the second force is the tire traction between your tires and the road. And if you're going too fast, you just simply might not have enough traction to keep from skidding. Um, Traction from your tires has to be able to overcome energy of motion for you to stay safe and on the roadway. So what are some things that affect our control in a curve? Well, the first is so obvious, and that's simply speed. The faster you're going, the harder it is to maintain control in that curve, and you might be going too fast and slide out. Uh, so what are things that they do to, to keep that from happening? Well, they make the curves gradual. Now, oftentimes out in the country, they're not that gradual. They're pretty sharp. But if you think about it, what about like an interstate on-ramp? Those curves are very gradual so that you have plenty of time to pick up speed, to be accelerating. Another thing that they'll do on some roads is they will bank the curves. So if you've ever noticed that a racetrack Going around the corners, it's not flat like this because if it was, the cars would have to slow down a lot more than they do. But the corners are banked so that as a car comes around it, it's pushing into the roadway instead of trying to slide up the roadway so much. So banking curves is something that's done not just on racetracks, but it's done on, on curves on roadways as well. And then another one that a lot of times people don't think about is, is your car's load literally how much weight is your car carrying. And this is one of the reasons why we have the rule about having only one friend in a car. Because the more weight you have in a car, the harder it is to control that car going around a curve. And so this is something to keep in mind. If you're used to taking a curve at a certain speed out in the country when you're by yourself, and then you got a car full of people, 
you really should slow down more than normal because you've got more energy going into the curve from those extra people in there. Okay, that is where we are going to stop today's lecture. So like always, I hope you learned something. I hope you got something out of this lecture and understand a little bit more about natural laws and how they affect our driving. But even if you didn't, just like my favorite professor, Dr. Phillips used to say, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye. We'll see you.